Kreginici i kolege, dragi gosti, dobrodošli na Pravni fakultet Univerziteta u Beogradu. Ja sam Dušan Popović, redovni profesor i pozdravljam vas u ime organizatora. Ovaj skup, kao što vidite već po nazivu, je nešto malo drugačije u odnosu na konferencije koje smo organizovali prethodne četiri godine, što ne znači da nećemo ponovo organizovati konferencije intelektualna svojina i internet, nastavljamo već sledeće godine. Odlučili smo da se te konferencije u buduće organizuju svake druge godine i da se tada izdaje prateći zbornik, a sve u saradnji sa Fondacijom Registra nacionalnog internet domena Srbije, na čemu im se ja još jedan put najtoplije zahvaljujem. Međutim, pošto smo se svi navikli da se vidimo u junu i da ova naša mala zajednica stručnjaka za pravo intelektualne svojine koja se sve više širi, okupi u junu. Rešili smo da ipak ne preskočimo ove juni, a imali smo i veliku sreću da naš gost, dr. Sedrik Manara, direktor Google-a za autorsko pravo, prihvati naš poziv, tako da zaista imamo izuzetnu priliku da sa njim razgovaramo o autorskom pravu. Pre nego što dam reč našim pravim domaćinima, dekanu, pravnog fakulteta, profesoru Zoranu Mirkoviću i gospodinu Goranu Milankoviću, članu upravnog odbora registra nacionalnog internet domena Srbije. Ja bih želeo da se još jedan put zahvalim Rnicu, njegovom direktoru, gospodinu Vladimiru Maniću, koji je tu sa nama, članovima upravnog odbora i čitavi kancelarije Rnica na podršci tokom prethodnih pet godina i nadam se da ćemo ovu uspešnu saradnju nastaviti. Ja sada dajem reč našem domaćinu, dekanu, profesoru Zoranu Mirkoviću. Izvolite. Poštovane koleginice i kolege, dragi gosti, poštovani studenti, ja bi u ime pravnog fakulteta i u svoje lično ime pozdravio direktora fondacije Registra nacionalnog interdomena Srbije, gospodina Vladimira Manića, gospodina Gorana Milankovića, člana upravnog odbora i upravni odbor, i posebno našeg gosta, gospodina doktora Sedrika Manaru, jednog od direktora Google-a, direktora za autorsko pravo. Nama je zadovoljstvo i čas da vas sve ovde pozdravimo i da zapravo na ovom mestu isteknemo tu saradnju koja postoji između fondacije NIDS-a, kako je, bi ga skraćeno nazvali, i pravnog fakulteta, da je to dugogodišnja saradnja, da ova fondacija pomaže organizaciju skupova, pomoć je mi kolega Dušan, ovo je znači peta konferencija. Mi smo srećni i zadovoljni zbog toga. Želimo da isteknemo da naši profesori učestvuju kao arbitri u komisiji za rešavanje sporova. Znači, to je jedna saradnja koja je veoma plodna i koja će se, nadam se, nastaviti. Mi kao fakultet i kao akademska zajednica posvećujemo izuzetnu pažnju intelektualnoj svojini, koja postoji kao predmet, kao što znamo, i to kao obavezan predmet na osnovnim studijama, i već šestu godinu na obnovljenim, odnosno na ovim master studijama postoji predmet i studije iz prava intelektualne svojine. To je nešto što je, kako da kažem, veoma značajno i da se ta, kako reče kolega Dušan Popović, mala zajednica sve više razvija i da naš fakultet daje doprinost tom razvoju. Ja bih sve još jednom pozdravio i unaprijed se izvinio zbog toga što za 15 minuta mora da napustim ovaj skup. Mislio sam da slušam bar jedno izlaganje kolege Sedrika Manare, ali nisam prosto zakazane obaveze ranije mi to ne dozvoljavaju. Hvala. Molim. Zahvaljujem se dekanu profesoru Mirkoviću i sada dajem reč gospodinu Goranu Milankoviću, članu upravnog odbora Rnica. 
Registar nacionalnih trdovena Srbije je fond koji je osnovan pre 11 godina sa osnovnim zadatkom da upravlja domenima Srbije. Tada je postao samo jedan, sada imamo i čirilični i latinični. Naša saradnja sa pravnim fakultetom u Beogradu ide iz 2008. godine, pokazala se vrlo plodotvornom i po njihovoj ideji mi smo prihvatili da im pomažemo u organizaciji njihovih skupova o intelektualnoj svojini, na kojima sam ja svake godine od početka nešto novo naučio. Iskreno u svoje lično ime, ja se nadam da će to i ove godine da se desi, a nadam se da ste i vi zbog toga tu. Hvala vam. Hvala lepo, time smo završili ovaj mali ceremonijalni deo sa pozdravnim rečima i posle pauze koje će trajati nekoliko sekundi, nastavljamo, možemo već da pređemo dalje. So we are now switching to English and I would like to welcome our guest star, Dr. Cedric Manera, head of copyright at Google. Um, I will first uh, mention a few facts from Dr. Manera's CV. I'm sure that you have already Googled him, so uh, you're familiar with these, these facts. Um, Dr. Cedric Manera joined Google in 2013 after 40 years as a professor of law at EDEC Business School in, in Paris. Uh, EDEC is one of the best uh, business schools in, in Europe. Uh, his primary teaching and research interests concerned intellectual property in the digital um, context and electronic business law. Uh, from 2000 to 2013, Professor Manera was head columnist for Dalloz, a prominent Francophone law review, where he regularly published comments on internet-related cases. He has written numerous articles in French and foreign law reviews, and he is often quoted in the, in the press. He received the Google Research Award in 2010. He is also a domain dispute resolution panelist. He was a visiting scholar at the Institute for International Law and Public Policy at the Temple University, at the Institute of Intellectual Property Law in Japan, at the University of Salerno, at the IPR University Center in Helsinki. Professor Manar received his LN degree from the University of Lille in France and a PhD from the University of Versailles in France. Um, so, um, without any further ado, uh, Dr. Manera, I give you the floor. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I, I will stand up. If it's fine, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, there, uh, um, thank you. Actually, not thank you. Because you just reminded me how old I am. <laughs> I mean, 14 years of this, 6 years of that. Well. That's not really nice for the house, right? <laughs> These are the facts. So I've been young. And I say this because I see a lot of young faces here. Um, I just wanted to say something to begin with. It was not on my paper. Uh, but actually, um, when I was a law student, maybe s some of you are still law students, I didn't study IP law. I didn't study copyright. And interestingly, I didn't study internet law because back then, you know, internet was just... Uh, something very new and uh, no one paid attention to that. So uh, uh, interestingly, I've become, yes, I've, I've worked a lot in that field and now, um, so I've been teaching copyright even though I didn't learn it and now I advise a company on copyright. So I think that it's, it's an interesting story to share here. It's because most of the issues you will be working with, uh, working on, most of the issues you will be working on don't exist. And so I think this is part of the journey we'll be having together is look, to the future, look at how we can solve complex problems. So what matters is, you know, uh, how good you are at solving legal issues rather than really the knowledge of existing copyright law or Roman law or anything. Even the Roman law is really helpful in day-to-day -day practice. When you work at Google, you don't know what to work on, you don't know where to start looking from. Sometimes Romans, Roman law can be really useful. So work on your passion, work on what you like, and at some point you know, you're rewarded with what you want to work on. Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you to the University of Belgrade. Thank you, Dean and Sekudushan, for the invitation. And thank you to, so I don't never know how to pronounce it, Dinitz, Redi, Di, 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 uh, to the uh, Serbian Registry uh, for the invitation. Uh, so, um, 
I'm expected to, uh, <laughs> that's the other non thank you for Dushan, uh, to speak about, so let's see, the whether, yes, yeah. copyright law challenges on the internet in 20 minutes. Okay, so there are many challenges, not many minutes, and there are many, many legal challenges many, uh, in my field. Uh, so I had to select a few, but I guess the questions that follow, that we'll moderate, uh, will help us extend the scope. But um, I thought I would share with you um, uh, some of the truly global challenges, not just for Google, but for all intended companies, for users, for you, for you, uh, young professionals, future professionals, uh, uh, seasoned professionals. So it's one of the things I wanted to share with you. It's um, the challenges of more. With the internet, there's more. There's more creators. There's more content. There's more platforms. And this really has an impact, I think, on copyright law in general, because copyright law was designed primarily in the 19th century where just a few people knew how to write. Just a few people knew how to paint. Uh, there were no movies uh, when the Berne Convention was um, uh, entered into force in, in 1881. And I think that the premises, the paradigm on, upon which corporal law is, being, is based, already changing. Thanks to technology, thanks to the internet. And this is part of the journey I wanted to um, uh, take you uh, with me on. So there's more. There's more what? There are, there's more content, uh, there's more platforms where you can access uh, a lot of things. Uh, if you want to access Game of Thrones when it's being live streamed, uh, when it's being streamed on TV in the US, you can also access it on the platform at the same time. So the world has become global. You know, access is instantaneous. It, it's not you know, through windows like in, 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 uh, in movie theaters. It's instantaneous, it's global, and copyright law remains very territorial. And so, at the same time, you have the capacity, thanks to the internet, you have access to everything when you want it, provided you pay for it. We're going to speak about piracy later on. Problem is rights, you know? The thing is, sometimes the content is there, except that you can't access it just because you're not in a country where the platform has rights. So there's a thing here, we have this habit that the market is structured based on the territoriality of copyright law, at a time when the needs of the users, the expectations of the market, is really to be to have a truly global thing. When you travel, you want to access your favorite movies, your favorite series, your music, without seeing holes in your playlist, without not being able to, to access your favorite movie or series when you paid for it. So I think this is one of the thing, issues here, is the internet is global, copyright law remains territorial, and even though licenses can help uh, most of these issues, still the, um, the business approach is always this. So when we platforms, uh, such as those, you know, um, uh, so I can only, can I go back? Oh yes. When we platforms would love to offer you all the content that we got a license on globally and in real time, sometimes we're constrained. You know, the owners of the rights don't let us do. So there's a sort of gap between what platforms can offer you and what they would like to offer you. And that is, I think, one of the challenges. It's not a legal challenge. It can be solved through licenses. It's just a change in mind shift, uh, mindset, how, um, how businesses, how producers of content should look at reaching out to a global audience when the habit is to divide the world in territories, in markets, etc. So that's one of the issues here. There's more, except that there's not more. You know, sometimes the content is there, but except that it's not there. And so that's the other thing. It's, there are many platforms. Uh, I mentioned Hulu, Netflix, there's YouTube, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the same time, these platforms exist. There are more services through which you can access works, movies, music, uh, software, etc., because it's the age of multitude. IP was defined by scarcity, intellectual property. Things were rare. Now things aren't rare anymore. And I think it's one of the challenges, not just for corporate law, by the way, but when you can bring to the world many, many things because everyone knows how to write, everyone knows how to use a, a computer, everyone knows how to publish. It's very different than the world that existed back in the 19th century when 
uh, there were only a few people who were literate enough to create. And that's a, a, another challenge. So when we speak of content or works, works particularly by copyright, we don't speak anymore of the kind of works that the Berne Convention or other founding treaties had in mind. It's not just about long movies produced by the Hollywood industry. It's also about cat videos. You know these videos of a cat on a sca skateboard that you saw on YouTube. That's part of the content, that's part of the works people are now accessing to. So in other words, where you had a limited so, uh, uh, offer if you wanted to watch something, now you have an unlimited offer in many formats and of, of many genres. So it's not just professionally produced movie that cost a lot, it's also cat videos shot with your iPhone. And that is also a big change in how <coughs> people uh, consume content because really corporate law is about the public. So it's, it's this, it's content that goes online can be an extremely costly movie that takes hundreds of millions of dollars to produce to something that is offered for free by an amateur who wants to release this under a Creative Commons license. It's an open license with which you can say, well, what I did here, you can freely use it. Okay, so that's the world we're living in. It's a world where copyright law is for everyone, not just for the publishers of books, not just for the publishers, for the producers of movies and music. It's for you, it's for me, it's for everyone who wants to put something online. And it's become really easy to put something online. So that is one of the challenges, right? Uh, a copyright that, that works for everyone online and not just those lawmakers primarily had in mind throughout ages. And that is very important, I think, to uh, start our journey from. There's more works, there's more platforms, there are more people who are ready to uh, put things online. This is a photo that was taken when Pope Benedict uh, was uh, introduced. And uh, this photo, you have one phone here, someone's probably bored and looking at uh, text messages. And the photo was taken by a professional photographer and people pay attention to what's happening uh, at the Vatican. Eight years later, new Pope is introduced and this is it, you know? People take photos themselves. And I think this is what it's about. There was one photo of the event eight years before. There are many photos of the same event taken by a many. And so here you have, you know, someone from the Associated Press who was sent there. Now you don't even need to send a journalist. You don't even send to send a, a photo reporter anymore. Just need to go on Twitter and look at the pictures of the event. And they might be better, by the way, than this. So I think this is really it. If you want to keep one picture of that, it's this. It's that um, what people are taking here, pictures, those pictures themselves can be subject to copyright. And if they are, it really means, it really shows that copyright applies to everyone's daily, everyone's routine activity. And that's very important to keep in mind. So that's the power of the technology. We have in our hands powerful tools to write, take photos, make videos, and upload them instantly. And that's very uh, uh, fascinating. It also means that, again, if we had to roughly put this in stats, most, if not the end, vast majority, if not almost everything, uh, every piece of content that is visible on the web today is not produced by a news publisher, by a movie producer, by uh, a book publisher, it's produced by anyone. And so that is really a challenge. How does copyright work when it applies to everyone and every work? Think of YouTube. On YouTube, in just one minute, 500 hours of videos of video are being uploaded. One minute, 500 hours of videos. So two minutes, that's 1,000 hours. Count how, how much it is in one hour, in one day, etc. So that is a way to measure you know, how uh, works are being uh, uploaded to the web and shared globally instantaneously. So you have this content which is shared globally, 
and you have at the same time, you know, just a few Hollywood movies um, uh, shown or not in a country depending, you know, on, on this window and this timing, etc. That is a really different world. Same for, um, uh, oh, we have a problem here. So um, people write, they don't only uh, make videos or make pictures, they write stuff. Same thing, you know, uh, on Blogger, which is one of Google's ho uh, Google hosting platforms, uh, people blog and write things. And if we count, it can be up to two, 250,000 words a minute. Okay? And it's the same for photos. Uh, in our uh, annual report at Google, we wrote that in 2018, people have taken 1,000 billion photos collectively. 1,000 billion photos with their phone. Not all of them will go online, but that is, it really, I think it's a, a way to show how the multitude of works are now available. Works, I'm saying works, I see Dushan here saying, well, when someone is taking this picture, is it really protected by copyright? Well, that's, and one of the challenges here is that um, the threshold for protection of work is really low in US law, in most of the European jurisdictions, etc. So, yes, arguably, most of these works can be protected. Not everything, but still, if a company like Google has to treat works as if were protected, you know, so that is one thing here, and it's a case of everyone. But again, there's a question of law, but there's also a question of market access, pricing, etc. and I'm getting there. But this, that's the challenge, the challenges of more. Do you need to go? Yes. Thank you for coming. So, um, that's one of the first challenges. And I think that uh, it's not just Google's challenge, not just the rights holders industry challenge, everyone. You know, how do we think of copyright to make it fit for a digital age where Everyone is not just a user of someone that is content, but actually everyone is a producer of content. Everyone is a creator. Everyone is an author. And I think this photo encapsulates what I wanted to show you here. When you get, again, it really shows that, uh, you know, people are making photos all the time. You are doing so. What does it mean for the photo industry? When all these photos are available, etc., etc. So that's a starting point. There's more. And more was not the basis upon which the people who drafted the Berne Convention um, were, uh, they were not thinking of that word of multitude when they were protecting the rarity of creation that existed back then. So there's many challenges, because you wanted me to speak of challenges. Uh, the first is the challenges for the rights of this industry the music producers, the book publishers, the news publishers. Um, you can have photos, blog posts, um, <coughs> videos that are of the same quality, has heavily, uh, I mean, uh, highly costly uh, productions made by books publishers, news publishers, movie producers, etc. So some cat video can be more successful than a movie which costs $10 million to produce. And there's a competition between the two. So it's a question of quality. Sometimes, you know, when you have to make a choice, if you're, I don't know, you want to use a photo for an ad, you have the choice between a costly photo and a cheaper one, and you don't really see the difference, and you will go for the cheaper. Because it's available. And that means that, uh, cheaper if not free, by the way. So that means that, uh, the um, decline in revenues of some industries, the photo industry in particular, is not due to the existence of this platform, that platform. It just means it's just a result of people being empowered to share more and to decide to share more under the rules they decide. If you want to put things online for free, you mark your content as Creative Commons license, then you compete against all the industries that produce the same content for a fee. That is a big change. So the photo industry is a good case study because you've seen a decline. And many think that the decline was due to uh, uh, the um, 
the fact that phone cameras, I mean cameras with phones, uh, actually competed against the old Kodak and Nikon uh, cameras, it's just part of the story. Is that, yes, you have a phone, uh, you have a camera on your phone, but also you're using it, and you share it, and you share it in a way that competes with their content and their business. And so, one way to put it is this. You know, they're all beautiful photos made by the iPhone. I should have changed this because Google produces the Pixel and this is the best camera on the market because it's powered by artificial intelligence. I shouldn't have mentioned the iPhone, but you get the idea. So, movies shot on iPhone, photos shot on iPhone. And, you know, uh, sometimes on news on TV, you can see, you know, uh, 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 excerpts of YouTube videos being used in news and of good quality, etc. So, it's it. It's the combination of good technology in your pocket and the power of the internet and, and data servers that allow you know, the sharing of content that is of a high quality. And this content of high quality, again, competes with the industry's content. Uh, look at this graph. It's the number of photos uploaded to the most important social media platforms every day. So in 2015, it's the last figure I had, it was three billion photos uploaded every day. Three billion. So that's, you know, it's, it's an ocean compared to the drops uh, produced by uh, press publishers, photo reporters, etc. Not all this content is available for free or should be shared or should be shared without a fee. But if it is, again, the, uh, the gap between content that is free to use or free to share and the rest is important. How important? This, these are the last stats for the Creative Commons Foundation. And it shows an increase in the number of works that are freely available. So here it's people who know enough about copyright law to know that when they put something online, it may be, uh, it will be uh, impossible for others to use because, because copyright law prevents anyone from using someone else's content without permission. So when they post something online, a photo, a video, a blog post, etc., they will mark it with a CC, with a uh, Creative Commons license and say, well, it's yours, please take it. And the number of works and the number of people doing this increases every year. And then you have 1.4 billion works freely available, truly freely available. 1.4 billion is a lot, again. <laughs> so it means that uh, if you're, again, uh, in the, uh, if you're looking for content to buy, why would you buy this content it's if, if, it's, if you can get the same for nothing. Here's a photo I took of the box, uh, you know, my internet box I received a few months ago. And this is the package, and they're not really uh, visible. The photos on the package are CC licensed. In other words, this is a company that used to buy photos. It doesn't buy photos anymore. It just grabs them on the internet. And copyright law allows this. But that's the... Uh, different in the market. So think of it, when you think of the decrease, the decline in revenues of the industry, it's primarily due to competition. That content is everywhere to grab, and so that's why people do it. So that's the difference, you know, people used to select one newspaper and would read it on their way to work. Now what are people doing when they commute to work? Just look at their phone, and they can access not just one paper, but many. But they can also look at their Facebook timeline. They can also read blog posts. You know, so that's the big, big difference. You were captured in one space and you were uh, buying the content of one and now you can get access to all the content that's being streamed online, not just press content, by the way, but everything. So this is one of the challenges here, right? It's one of the um, uh, questions of how do we solve this? Is it for the law to solve that? Or is it for the market to think differently? So. Again, a uh, lot of authors I'm meeting in my work they say that internet is the source of piracy. Since the internet became popular, they see the revenue decrease. Same for producers I'm talking to. Is it really due to the fact that there's piracy? Or is it simply due to the fact that there's just all the forms of content that people are looking at, getting access to, Legally speaking, okay, so the problem, is it copyright infringement or is it a market problem? 
Also, you know, uh, the music industry, and I think we will discuss about this afterwards, the music industry says there's a decline in revenues. But there's more artists than ever. There are YouTubers who, uh, who make music. And young people would prefer to listen to the YouTubers rather than buy CDs of, you know, uh, CDs. What is a CD? Uh, buy albums of older artists. So that is also, you know, the new world we're in. How do we address this? Overall, there's more money. There's more money because there's more creators and there's more ways to access it. The difference is that there are more people who create. And so you have a bigger pie, but you, have, you also have many, many more shares. So the revenue in overall is increasing. It's just divided between more. And I think this beauty of the internet is more democratic. But still, you know, this is not always recognized. And the other thing is that because there's so much content, the real value is not in the creation of the content, but much more in how you organize it, how you make people um, uh, empowered to access it, etc. So the value moves from the content to the service around the content. The value of Flickr, you know, Flickr is a, a photo repository. Flickr is mostly populated by Creative Commons licenses. So it's people who like to share for free. But still, Flickr has a value because it provides a place for photo lovers. And the value will be derived from different services um, um, that are uh, attached to the content. It's this. It's the, the difference in approach. So maybe it's not a question of property, not a question of copyright law, but much more, what do we do from the basis of existing copyright laws to actually make sure copyright law fulfills its goal, which is to make sure people are, are rewarded, offers are compensated. That's the other question here. So it's this, you know, uh, if the Hollywood industry, uh, if, sorry, if a cat video competes with a Hollywood movie, with a Hollywood blockbuster, it means that maybe Hollywood movies also need to be on YouTube, for example, or need to be where the eyeballs are and not just in theaters. Maybe, you know, we need to think differently on how distribution of content is being made, much more than, you know, um, solving piracy problems or things like this. So, um, there's more, more content, more works, more platforms, more users, more money, divided by more people. Um, we really think that overall the internet is good for creation and good for corporate world. In other words, uh, we think that there's more value with the internet and trying to control it through copyright laws uh, and that uh, the existence of platforms enables YouTubers, for example, to thrive and, and be visible, etc. So we think that overall the internet is good because it helps creativity, it helps compensate authors, it gives global audiences to small creators, etc. etc. So uh, you can thrive in a world of more, it's just more complicated. The uh, market for access to works is global, and when the thinking, the mindset in copyright is often territorial. So uh, you see this, you see that recently studios created their own distribution platforms. You see that music producers such as Sony or Universal, they're buying shares in Deezer, for example. Deezer is the, uh, uh, one of the leading uh, European services, and in, in, not in Deezer, sorry, it's, it's Spotify. So it's this, the, the, the industry realizes that the value is not, or is not just, in the creation of works, in the investment of works, but also in the investment and distribution. And that is one of the challenges of the internet, realizing that it is mostly a distribution channel, and that you have to be good at distributing content is there, the works are there, and there are millions, billions. The question is really, how do you make sure the content is being paid for by the person you want to have, you, you want them to pay for, etc. So this is one of the uh, things I wanted to talk about. So uh, at Google, we have different uh, services that we think are helpful for uh, uh, creators, a uh, creation, and that overall technology is good because when you have technology that can be used by anyone to create, there's more um, and there's more creativity than ever. And overall, it's good to see people create. And also, we think that technology is one of the ways to solve copyright challenges. 
And I will stop there, Dushan, because I think this is the starting point for your questions and the questions of the audience. Okay, if you like, we can stop, but... Uh, yes. Okay. Well, thank you for... <laughs> thank you for this very insightful and passionate presentation. Uh, and uh, we are actually going to use the remaining time to engage into dialogue with our guest. Uh, I will start by asking several questions and then the floor is yours. We have also received some, some questions by email as it was announced uh, in our um, program. Uh, so um, you have probably noticed that uh, Cedric avoided to speak about the uh, EU Copyright Law Directive. Uh, but actually, um, I'm being a little harsh on him. He was not avoiding it. I was telling him to avoid the topic because I was going to ask the question. So, of course, we should discuss the uh, newly adopted um, EU Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market. Um, the, as you know, the Member States now have two years uh, to implement it. So, we will see what uh, is this going to give us, uh, but uh, one is sure is that uh, we are going to have a more complex environment for companies like Google to, to work in, because once again, the European Union has chosen a directive, meaning that we will end up with 28 slightly different uh, legal regimes. Um, and uh, speaking about the, um, the um, copyright directive, um, I would like to hear um, your comment on the uh, newly introduced press publisher, press publishers' right. Um, we have been following the discussion here as uh, we are very much interested in Serbia in what is going on in the EU law, given the fact that we are aspiring to join the Union and we are a candidate country. Uh, and sooner and later, our copyright law is going to be harmonized with the directive. Uh, itself. So um, Google was very critical of the, on the introduction of this new press publisher's right. There was a, a kind of a, for me, a strange coalition between, on the one hand, Google and um, on the other hand, um, um, organizations uh, fighting for um, um, human rights and um, freedom of the internet, uh, let's put it that way. Um, but this argument actually against the introduction of the press publishers' rights was supported by the, um, a lot of IP law professors in, uh, in Europe. Um, there was a, an open letter sent by 228 IP and IT law professors to the European Parliament in 2018, and I also signed uh, that, that petition. So um, just to, uh, um, allow me a, a, a personal comment. Uh, we actually didn't achieve anything, so this is just uh, another occasion for me to realize that, I, that law professors are not uh, influencing the legislative procedure anywhere, not only um, here. Um, but I was a bit surprised to see that um, actually Google didn't achieve anything, so we ended up with <laughs> the new press publishers' rights. So could you please comment on that and remind us of of uh, Google's arguments against the introduction of that time. Uh, yes, there are many, many things in your question. How much time? I, I think it's an you oral exam time. here. Yeah. So uh, how much time do you have? You do have time. So, um, so, so just a comment on, on when you said that there was a strange coalition between. Yeah, I've seen between, you the face, yes. Um, there's been many voices against the press publishers' right. Uh, and I think academics, were more vocal than we were, uh, but it's not just academics and Google. And uh, it was also consumer associations, small publishers, because small publishers hate the right that will, you know, uh, uh, primarily benefit large publishers. I will get back to that in a minute. And also startups. So it's, it was really, you know, the ecosystem that was against the introduction of this new um, special property right for press publishers. Um, so it's not just Google. So you, typically this battle has been described as the battle between news publishers and Google. Actually, it's a battle about the internet and how content should be shared freely or not by anyone and not just by Google. And let me get there because there's a reason why we oppose the right. 
So this right is new in the directive. The directive was enacted, was uh, adopted in, uh, in April. And uh, April 2019, the first form of press publisher right we saw was in 2013 in Germany. I joined Google on July 1st, 2013. The law in Germany entered into force into, uh, in, on August 1st there. So it's really my life at Google, my life as a copyright lawyer at Google is really, you know, overlapping with the uh, existence of a new publisher's right. So Germany in 2013 to protect uh, press publishers introduced uh, this, um, uh, what we call ancillary copyright, neighboring right for press publishers. Uh, we were indexing uh, the content, the articles of the press publishers. Let me open a bracket here. We were indexing the content of press publishers that accepted to be indexed. If you don't want to be on Google search, if you don't want to be on Google news, it's really easy. You just need to put something in the code of your page, of your website, and we don't index you. So publishers are in control. If they don't want to be in Google, or if they want their website to be on Google, or just a page, or a part of the site, they can always do this. You know, to index, you need to have a, a bot, a robot, that looks at the pages, and if in the code of the pages, written, oh, no, no, bot, you cannot index, then the bot cannot index. It's as simple as this. So this has been the basis upon which indexation has been working. So we had an index built until 2013 based on uh, the consent of the websites around the world, including news publishers' websites. When the new right was introduced in Germany in August 2013, we realized we didn't have the right to index because we needed to have another new consent. Okay, that's how IP law works. That's very important to understand here because first, we comply with the law. You know, we respect copyright. Google is not an enemy of copyright, contrary to what I read in the press. Google is not an enemy of copyright. So here, when press publishers were um, uh, granted a new right, we took it into account and we reach out to all 5,000 titles that were back then indexed in Google News in Germany to say, look, you might be legally entitled to object to indexation. Are you okay with us keeping on showing your content? 5,000 titles, okay? We uh, reach out to the titles uh, where in our indexed, 2,000 did not answer. Why? Because maybe we wrote in German and they didn't understand, or maybe they just didn't understand the legal question, or maybe they didn't read the email or it went to spam, I don't know. But we lost 2,000, not the major titles, but we lost 2,000 out of 5,000. That is the first effect of the introduction of a right in the internet ecosystem. You lose the long tail. And when I saw that originally in the 2016 directive, the justification for the press publisher's right was diversity of journalism. No, it's not for diversity. Because the first impact this right had was to make invisible two sun titles. So this is very important here. When introduce a new parameter, a new legal element indexation, you know, we at Google, we want our indexes to be as exhaustive as possible. Here, it shrinked the index and it prevented our users from accessing titles they wouldn't otherwise know. It's not the large titles such as Bild or Zeitung in, in Germany that disappeared. It's most niche blogs or things like this. They disappeared because of the action we had to take based on that. We did that. We have lawyers. All the smaller aggregators in Germany, they shut down because they didn't know how to do this. So that's another impact, negative impact. It's just the beginning of a story here. Fast forward to October. So we were in August 2013. In October 2013, the uh, uh, collecting society, uh, VG Media, it's a German collecting society, wrote to us a nice uh, season thesis letter saying, well, you index 200 of the titles of our members. We want you to remove these titles from your index. 
So they had said yes when in August we said, do you confirm you still want to be an index? But in October, about this, you know, they changed ideas, say, well, you want, you want to remove? Okay, you know, again, we comply with the law. So because they said that, we don't want to be in the index, we remove them altogether, 200 titles. Immediately, there's been a drop in the traffic to these sites, a big drop. So they lost advertising revenues because they lost traffic. Uh, in a month, Google is sending about 10 billion clicks to uh, uh, press publishers worldwide. So I think that here, you know, the, the, uh, the decision to remove hit hard on the publishers. But again, it was in response to their uh, will to be excluded from the index. After 15 days, they wrote back and said, no, no, we want to be in the index. And I'm saying this because uh, it's very important to understand that it's not a battle between Google on one hand and press publishers. I think it shows that it's really a win-win situation. We succeed when press publishers succeed. We are happy to provide more access to more content. At the same time, press publishers, they need to have entry points, and Google search engine is one of them. Not many more. You know, Facebook, etc. there's also a, a source of traffic. But still, it shows that this is a win-win situation. It's a symbiotic relationship between Google and the ecosystem. Okay, so it's important to, to keep this in mind because uh, there's never been any intent from us to you know, derive revenues from press publishers. You know, if you see uh, press uh, content uh, in snippets in Google search, there's no ads next to it. We don't place ads next to press content, never. Okay, so we don't make money from press content contrary to what I hear. So there, from there, to, uh, one important thing is uh, that after that, the uh, Collecting Society, the Gay Media, decided to go to the competition authority to say, well, we had no choice but to, uh, to write you back to be re-indexed, okay? Because you removed us, we had to uh, ask for re-inclusion, but actually you forced us. You're a dominant company. And interestingly here, the competition authority, and that was confirmed later in appeal, the two decisions said that uh, <clears throat> there was a, a good win-win situation. Win-win is really in the decision. It was a good win-win situation between Google and the press publishers, and the introduction of the press publishers' right actually disrupted that, was troublemaker. And I think it's important because a lot of the lobbying we saw in the press publishers' context was based on emotion or, you know, prospective figures. The competition authority in Germany really looked at the figures, really looked at the impact on the market, and found that, no, it's okay not to take licenses. You, you can never be forced to take licenses, and it was our decision. It's okay to do what we did, and ultimately, the problem came from the press, the introduction of the press publisher right, rather than uh, uh, what uh, Google did. In Spain, there's been something uh, similar. In Spain, we decided to shut down Google News. The, the law was a bit different. The competition authority there issued a report to say that um, the introduction of press publisher right was actually a barrier to entry to small publishers. Because here, we completely shut down Google News. So for a moment, traffic to all press decreased. And after a while, what did users do? They, go to El, they went to El País because it's a big brand. And they only went to El País, but not to smaller press uh, uh, publishers. And so here there's been a, an imbalance in competition because only some were winners. And that's actually the reason why small publishers oppose uh, the uh, title. Last thing about it. Uh, I told you the, um, the justification for the press publishers' right originally was diversity of journalism. Over the different versions of directive, if you look at the most recent one, it's quality journalism, quality. So let's speak of quality. Are there any journalists here? I assume. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so as Dushan knows, and uh, all IP lawyers in the room know, copyright laws are there to reward creative content, something that's creative. If you look at the press publisher's right, it's there to reward investment. So whatever you produce, and I use the word produce uh, purposefully, will be protected. 
So there's an incentive for, to produce more, but not to produce quality. That, I would say, is the direct result of the wording of the law. But there's another problem about quality. I told you, in Germany, we lost two southern titles out of 5,000, about 5,000 we had back then. What would happen today if we have this, you know, press publisher's right at the European level? If there's the same proportion of sites that say, well, I don't want to be an index anymore, okay, what do we do? We keep indexing the order. Um, what does it mean for not just the diversity and pluralism of sources, but also for the question of quality? We index the world, we index the web, we index everything, including fake news. You know, there are things that are fake or ide ideologically driven news. So let's say you have, on one hand, Russia Today and Sputnik. You know, it's paid by the Russian state to uh, provide news from a certain perspective. And on the other hand, you have impartial uh, press. The press publisher's right is introduced. These, the, the, the press publishers on my right, who do their job well, they would say, no, no, we don't want to be in the index anymore. We don't want to be indexed uh, because we have a right to uh, prevent you from doing so. The other here, that the goal is propaganda. It's not just providing news. They want the content to be disseminated. They want it. So they will accept the content to be disseminated for free. So there will be different strategies. Some will want payment. Some will say, okay, we give you a free license. What does it mean intimately? It means that when you put a price tag on information on the internet, the information that is free circulates more widely and, and, and circulates a bet, bet, better than quality information. So this is really important to, be, to see here. We are not opposed to the press publisher's right because we oppose copyright. We just base our analysis on data and on experience. It's been six years, more six years that the law exists in Germany. It's completely useless. It doesn't work. It didn't provide a single euro to anyone except our lawyers. Uh, so it doesn't work. And why would you want to replicate at European level something that doesn't work in, in Germany? Why? You said you were not successful to convince this. We were not successful neither. And that is the um, intriguing world of power and lawmaking. You know, It's not because you have the right argument that you succeed. Yes, but at least there is a shorter duration of that right in the final text that was adopted only two years uh, compared to 20 years initially proposed by the European Commission. So there, there it was, was some... No, it was one year in the beginning. There was, uh, it, was, it became 20 years in the Parliament. Oh. It was one year. Yeah. Right, but me. the lobbying was successful. I'm not saying Google's lobbying, but the lobbying of all that were against the introduction of that, that right was to some extent it's successful, but we'll see what the future will give us in the next two years. I would like us to uh, remain on the topic of the Digital Single Market Directive. So um, I think that uh, the audience is more interested in uh, the safe harbor rules than in the press publisher's rights. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody has been discussing the uh, safe harbor, new safe harbor rules, which uh, will be applicable only to uh, copyright infringements. So we are now in uh, an environment where the old safe harbor rules under the um, Electronic Commerce Directive remain applicable to other type of infringement but copyright. And we have new safe harbor rules applicable only to, to copyright. Um, you're going to deal with this. I know that you cannot comment on uh, how Google is going to adapt to, to this in the future, but could you share your thoughts on, on this new regime, which is um, stricter, I would say, and more complex for, for, for you, uh, for YouTube and similar services uh, to comply with? Uh, yes, I would try to make this shorter than a previous answer. But, um, so, um, Yes, uh, you said the article, you, 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 for you it's clear, the articulation between the e-commerce directive and the new directive on copyright, uh, the rules of copyright prevail. 
actually, when you read you know, the recitals and the text, it's unclear exactly how the e-commerce directive and the Article 7, new Article 17 uh, should be combined. So I think there's still an open question as to to what extent the safe harbors remain preserved or not. Mm -hmm. But actually, I wanted to, to use this to introduce the answer because the main problem we are having, and actually I think everyone in the industry is having, is to really understand what that provision means. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, how do you work on the basis of a text that is uncertain, that it takes that is that has vague new standards, untested requirements? You know, so we are lawyers here, I guess m most of us, and so you love, you would love to have legal certainty. We don't have it. We don't have it in the text. Okay. We have a history at Google of dealing with uncertainty. You know, we launch services that don't exist. Search engine, for example, there was not a single mention of search engines in legislation for years. So it's not the problem here. It's the combination of uncertainty with a different approach to liability. Okay? We have, we are seeing every minute, 500 hours of video uploaded to YouTube. And we don't control that. We have no idea what you are doing. But now what we know is that we can be liable for what goes to our platform. So what should be our approach? And in other words, the difference is that we know we are liable not when we are given notice that something is infringing copyright, as exists in the current regime in EU law, in uh, US law, but we know we're liable under different conditions. And the liability may be triggered earlier than today with a notice and takedown regime. So what do we do with that? What should be our approach? Okay, we take down everything where we don't, we're not sure. Should we do this? We leave everything because, well, uh, we think it's our mission to uh, provide, to give a voice to everyone. Maybe we should do it because um, there's a, 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 court of, a European Court of Human Rights decision that clearly shows that YouTube is a speech engine. And that it protects everyone's freedom and this language on freedoms in, in, in the provision. So, you know, from the extreme of blocking everything except when it's licensed and let leaving everything online, there are many different options here. And so uh, this is, I think, where we are to answer your question is this is a directive. And, you know, states have to um, uh, transpose and give flesh and blood to, the, to this uh, provision. So it's, the, the real answer will depend on how um, uh, strong or severe the transposition, transposition is. Um, the other thing is we know that the, um, so there's, there's an implied reference in Article 17 to content recognition technologies. The idea that whenever you upload something, if there's music in the background, uh, we have the capacity, we developed at YouTube the capacity to recognize the music with a technology called Content ID. So we work with partners around the world. See my slide, no technology can solve copyright issues. Uh, so nine southern partners have brought to us 85 southern reference files. So it's the file of music or videos they own and they want us to recognize the content. We have this, okay? By the way, it's costly to develop, so that's a problem for other non-YouTube companies. Uh, but what we mean here is that that's just 85 million with nine southern partners. So we have the capacity to prevent copyright infringement for these works, but the rest. Now, how do we work with something beyond music, beyond video? And that's the problem for YouTube and for everyone today which is impacted by Article 17. So when you combine this, you know, the, uh, the, um, again, the liability uh, that changed together with the risk approach, what can you expect for platforms? Will they monitor and clear everything and they will look more like TVs? Or will they stay, you know, something which is really um, uh, closer to what they used to be? You know, everyone has a voice like on YouTube. That is really the challenge we, we're going to live in. So uh, um, I think this is the, uh, the, um, the musings we're having, the, uh, the challenging challenges we're facing. Uh, so 
Yes, um, we wanted to warn the legislator, the lawmaker, that they shouldn't do, be doing this. They should preserve the safe harbors. I'm not sure the text is the correct result of that. Um, I'm concerned uh, to see that, yes, we can be liable for anyone's uh, uh, illegal activities on our platforms. And so uh, we'll try to find the best solution. You know. Thank you. Um, while I, you were answering the question, I was thinking about something I think always when I read the new directive, meaning that uh, preamble is very useful, but sometimes you you think uh, uh, when you read it, when you realize that actually you don't find in the articles what you read in the preamble, uh, and that's the problem. But uh, this is actually the problem that the legis national legislator in the member states will go will going to, to face when transposing the the text. And there are some terms used uh, which are not the best uh, one chosen, I would say, at, at least for my taste, like best effort, mm -hmm. make best effort, what is the best effort, etc. And, um, and that's just one of them. I told yeah. you, it's a, it's a full of vague standards or untested yes. requirements. That's the problem. Is. Um, we'll now uh, leave the topic of the uh, Digital Single Market Directive. Perhaps some of you will uh, go back here, uh, but I would like to ask one question which corresponds to a question we received by email from our former uh, master student, Ognjen Uzelat. So, um, um, both him and I would like to, um, for you to, to comment on the, um, the usual critique YouTube is uh, uh, exposed to, uh, and that is something you briefly mentioned in your presentation, that YouTube is paying relatively small fees for music videos compared to streaming services. Um, what is your position on that? Uh, first, we pay. Now, this is very important because, I mean, this is a hosting platform where content is being uploaded by users and our only duty under the law would be to remove when we receive notice. At YouTube, we decided to do differently. We decided to take licenses for the content to stay online. This was a business decision. You know, remember Justin Bieber who was a YouTuber before being a big star and he started being a star on YouTube by singing covers, by singing other songs. And so we realized that if we wanted other uh, emerging stars to be uh, spotted and, and to, to thrive online, we should protect the content. And that's why we proactively decided to take licenses. We don't have this obligation. We nevertheless decided to take licenses with music publishers at their rate. You know, we don't fix the rates. They have a monopoly. So that's very important to keep in mind here. This debate is about YouTube and others, but actually it should be about non-YouTube platforms that don't pay anything. We do pay. That's the first point. The second thing is the fee you, you refer to, and I'd like to see figures, it's the fee paid by the intermediaries. You know, we have licenses with music producers and then they share with their members, with their authors. You know, something might disappear in between. You know, it's not this, it's about users on YouTube and it's the actual income of the creator, but there's a chain between that. Okay, never forget that. The third thing is the users you, you refer to or users paid for by ads, by advertising. You know, that's the beauty of YouTube. You can access many things and most, I mean, most of it is free. There's a VOD part on, on YouTube and a, we have a, a paid for service now. But it means that we manage to create new revenue opportunities based on advertising where people would otherwise access this content for free either on YouTube or elsewhere. You know, so we decided to create a revenue stream for this. And when you look at, you know, how the internet economy is thriving, it creates more and more billions uh, every year. Then I see the, um, the figures yesterday or the day before, uh, the uh, revenues of the music industry should double in, in, in five years time. You know, there's more uses of streaming. Some of the streaming is subscription based like Spotify and all the forms is people who would never pay for a subscription. You know, people who just use music one hour a month where when you're, you're a Spotify subscriber, you listen to music 50 hours a, a week, for example. People go to YouTube, they don't have the same expectations, they wouldn't pay for music otherwise. 
So I think that overall these fees or whatever you call them are actually, you know, it comes on top of what all the internet services are bringing. So it's this that you have to keep in mind, is that the comparison between what people earn here and what people earn there is very different. Also recall that YouTube is a video sharing platform and other audio streaming. So in other words, the duration of videos can be longer than the uh, duration of a music stream. So there's more opportunity to have ads, for example, on a music stream than on a music in the background of a long video, etc. So the post stream comparison doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. So comparison doesn't make sense if you think of the nat nature of the service, the nature of the use, the purpose of the service, and how it is financed. Overall, I think that the real answer to the question is, what do authors get in exchange? They are being paid where they wouldn't otherwise be paid. I think this is really the answer to your question. Thank you. I don't want to monopolize all the time, so the floor is yours. Please introduce yourself and ask the question. Yes, please. Oh, sorry, I haven't. Yeah, but can you ask the question now? Can you ask? I think we will tell it better. Okay, then in the meantime, while I uh, check the email, uh, can somebody else ask the question? Uh, don't be shy. I have been saying that we have excellent students and former students. Yes, we have one question here yeah. first. <laughs> for everyone who has some creative content. So, um, just a second. Right now we are in, uh, how I can say, I can say maybe um, fifth uh, digital industry, something like that. They are mentioning that on the internet. And uh, we, speak, we speak all the time about artificial intelligence, about uh, robots, about uh, bioengineering. And so do you think that a uh, legal system uh, needs to actually has a challenge, so need to be changed in the next 10 years? Uh, I mean, to follow all these it's 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 a very broad question, but a very great one because I think you pointed the finger to something I should have included in my yeah. presentation. It's I, I mentioned human uh, human generated creations, where yeah. I think the question is really about computer generated creations, and it's not just here. That, I mean, with artificial intelligence, we might land not in the age of multitude, but the age you know of zillions of things, you know, so, of works. Uh, or, or, not sure it should be called works, by the way. But I think the, the question really is about, you know, what does it mean to have a world where most of the works that are being, most of the creations are, you know, paintings, uh, images, texts, are not being produced by human, but by machines. Yeah. And so here it really questions, you know, not copyright in general. Copyright is not for machines. You know, co copyright is about human creation. So here it really questions the fate of creation tomorrow, the destiny of creation. And um, the answer here, and, and I think this is why your question was for the challenges to the legal system in general, the answer should be in copyright law. The answer should be really what the society uh, wants to do with AI, with artificial intelligence in general. There are many challenges like those. I think, you know, ultimately will be, I mean, when you have the chance to have machines do the work for you, it will be better for everyone, you know, uh, and this is really my belief. But uh, you're right to make the link between the end of my presentation on the multitude and what's next, the next wave will probably be, you said the fifth digital industry, but the next wave will probably be machine generated content, all forms of content. And what does that mean for society in general? I think this is the big question. I don't want to, I don't have an answer uh, to yeah, provide. I just thought since uh, we don't have the legal norms to follow all of that, or I think that, so 
do we need some uh, new legal norms or new directives to follow all of that? There was no legal norms for such How change. How the, the legal system will be changed, uh, for example, in the next 10 years? Well, the, in general, we think we should not over-regulate inno innovation, you know, because if you constrain innovation before it's being developed, then what's left for, you know, uh, innovation itself? I mean, you said, well, we need to proactively regulate this field. Our first engine was designed in tw 20 years ago. Do you think we needed 21 years ago uh, rules to regulate such engines? And if we had needed them, what would have, how would we drive them? We have no idea what such engines would look like. Just show that there was, there's been a lot of value, you know, brought by such engines. And progressively, they uh, had such a social impact that things had to be corrected. And we made product changes to address that. So, uh, in general, we don't think that the approach should be, you know, to have preemptive, restrictive laws and that innovation should be, should thrive in a permissive environment and then, you know, together with lawmakers, change things when they don't work. I think this is the a, a preferable, preferable approach. Thank you. Uh, before Professor Markovic asks uh, his question, uh, just uh, um, the, the question we had. Your name is Nikola Cekic. Okay, I have your question. Please. I will continue uh, on uh, YouTube and uh, music. Um, you told us that uh, you are one of the platforms that even pays something for having music. Uh, I mean, paying for music is an obligation. Uh, so um, I am aware of the fact that uh, YouTube has uh, uh, made an endeavor to conclude the contracts with uh, many collecting societies in the field of music, or with some of them. I know at least some of them in this region. Some of them have signed the contract, some of them didn't. I know the long uh, period of negotiations you had with, uh, with German Gamma, for example, and I think it was concluded successfully somehow. You never uh, make the details public, of course, so nobody knows how much you paid to the others. And uh, I think uh, there is uh, obviously enough reason to be a little bit suspicious about this practice. Do you have some uh, comment on that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, first, a, a legal comment, because you're an esteemed professor and I don't think you mean it when they say we, sh we, we use music. There's still an open question as to who's using music on our platform. Uh, the directive provides an answer we communicate to the public. But this answer is still, you know, and, and decided at the European level, there's a case pending before the Court of Justice in Peterson versus YouTube, which asks this very question. Does YouTube communicate work to the public or is it the users? And this is very important to, just to comment on the first part of your question, which is who should pay for music? You know, um, we decided we should pay, I told you, because it was a business decision. Legally speaking, as of today, users decide what they want to put on platforms. They control what they put on platforms. They can remove it when they want. So if they decide what goes online, if they control it and can remove it, we cannot take action on this. So we believe that because they make the acts, the relevant copyright acts and not us, they are the users and not us. Okay, so um, I don't want to provide a legal answer to your much more to a broad question on you know who should pay for music but this is um just a, a comment on this we provided a market decision we provided a, a, a business decision to a more global problem which is the use of music online and who, who should be considered we respect music we respect music deeply that's the reason why when we had this negotiation with gema in germany we decided to block access to music videos in, on, on YouTube. We could have said, you know, uh, th there was an injunction, so it's a big difference. But still, you know, it showed that we wanted to um, 
to say we really want to partner with the music industry. This deal with GEMA, like all the deals with collecting societies, as you pointed, is confidential. This has been a problem for us when we've been accused of not paying enough uh, the uh, music industry. In August last year, we were fed up with that. So we published a blog post where we said, we are committed to transparency. We invited all the music industry, all our partners, to waive confidentiality on the clauses, the clauses they impose on us, we love transparency at, uh, at YouTube. And we said, OK, wave confidentiality, allow us to show exactly, to say the world exactly how much you pay GEMA, how much you pay others. This was welcomed with an astonishing silence. No one wants to disclose how much they make for us for the reason I was saying before. It's because not all the money we pay to YouTube goes to, uh, to the collecting society members, for example, or I suspect this. So you're right to say you can be suspicious, but are you suspicious against the right uh, intermediary? Okay. Uh, first of all, I think if, when uh, YouTube decides to conclude a contract with, uh, with Gamma, for example, it uh, uh, implicitly says that uh, it needs a license. It puts itself in the position of someone who is a user. I mean, uh, persisting on this position that you're only an intermediary wouldn't uh, bring you to any negotiations with any of these uh, collecting societies. I mean, I understand that this is a n not so clear position and I <coughs> Uh, from the business perspective, I can uh, understand that, that you are trying uh, uh, several approaches and so on. But uh, de definitely, I mean, if someone concludes a contract with a collecting society, he assumes the position of someone who needs their license and who needs to pay. I mean, that is how I see it. I understand that you have probably a slightly it, it, different position. but Yes, it's a business agreement we, we wanted to have with mm -hmm. most of the actors in the music industry to make sure we have the best user experience. People love music. We want music to be on YouTube. Let's find a way to do it. How you qualify that, you know, is you, I mean, it, it's a creative a partnership we wanted to have. But again, we respect music. We love music. We want users to be able, be able to access it. What it means in terms of law is probably what inspired the lawmaker here. They said, well, okay, now all platforms communicate, okay? Uh, and this is a clear answer to a long-standing problem. Again, I'm expecting the outcome in Peterson to see whether or not we actually do this. You know, still, regardless of the outcome, we still want to partner with the music industry. I think this is really what should be uh, uh, reminded here. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, thank you. And can the, the outcome in Peterson be different given the fact that, if I recall well, in the preamble of the directive, it is stated that the directive merely clarifies that the platforms communicate to the public. So apparently they do communicate to the public if the directive is only clarifying that. So. so well, th that, that goes back to my answer to you on Art 17. Uh, if you look at the Parade decision, for example, the, the CGU said, well, Parade communicates with the public, but this was based only on the copyright directive and not based on both the copyright directive and the e-commerce directive. Mm -hmm. I think this case, Peterson, will provide the answer based on the combination of those two, which is the, the big unknown today. Yeah. How do we combine the two and which prevail over the others? Um, we have one question uh, by email, uh, but it's not copyright law rela related. I will translate it because I don't want to be accused of any censorship, but it is not copyright law related. It is more surveillance related. Um, so um, Mr. Nikola Cekic wants to know uh, how does the voice algorithm works because he was testing it. He was having a conversation with a friend also using Android and uh, two hours later, he received sponsored ads related to the content of, of that uh, voice conversation, if I'm 
translating well the question. So if you want to comment or not, because um, we clearly indicated that this is a copyright law discussion. Mm. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. So uh, it's always difficult to comment on specific cases so because I don't have all the facts. I won't comment on the cases. Just uh, so you know, it's very important for you and for uh, all users of our services in the room to know that you're always in control. So if you think something strange happened, maybe it's a bug, maybe it's different, but you should check the settings. You know, you should check how we use or not the voice, how we activate it, and if you're uncomfortable with that, just turn it off. So maybe, you know, uh, it's just that, but if you believe there's a link between, you know, this action, so an ad we triggered and what you do, did two hours before, so either you can fully control the experience, you can prevent any use of your voice, and if you want to allow it because you find it's useful, then you can also find you. We explain our, how our services work on our help center. Sometimes it's very detailed, but we really we are transparent. <laughs> transparent. So uh, we really explain that. So really, I I cannot comment on your specific case, but I will encourage you to either um, make sure you remain in control by looking at the settings, or um, uh, learn more about how our services work by looking at our, uh, not, not, the term, not the terms of use, the help center where we explain everything, okay? okay uh, we, we have one question from uh, that one, side, uh, our former master student. Well, actually still a still. master student, okay. yeah. Um, hello. Um, is everything okay? Well, uh, I believe it would be interesting to hear your personal opinion about a certain rule uh, which has its origins in French law. Well, a rule that uh, imposes the limitation of internet access to a person who has made a copyright infringement multiple times. Um, well, as I said, this rule has its origins in France and I know that some countries have followed this rule like Republic of Korea and some other countries, some of them have not. Uh, you cannot find a rule like this here in Serbia. Well, I would like to know how do you personally feel about it? Do you feel like the punishment actually fits the <coughs> crime in this case, since you work at Google? And um, how do you intuitively feel about this rule? Uh, so I'm looking at the camera here because I just want to say that I was asked my personal opinion. Okay, so, so this is not Google speaking, it's a French person speaking, used to the system. Um, I remind you of the live streaming. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important. So should, can we have a, a, you know, a caption saying this is a personal opinion? Um, so in the system you described, maybe for those who are not familiar, if, you, if you've been caught downloading illegal content from the internet, infringing content, you will receive an email saying, hey, this is what's bad. Then second time you, you're caught, you receive a notified letter. And third time you can get a fine or you can go to a court. Okay, that's it's called a three strikes uh, system. Um, if you look at the stats, about five million, five million people have received an email in France. Uh, I think it's a six figures uh, some for the second uh, phase, uh, the notify letter, and about 100 people went to the third phase. Does it mean that actually when you've been caught, when you receive an email saying, hey, we know what you're doing here, you've been downloading Game of Thrones, you should not be doing it, people stop? No. Unfortunately, people stopped downloading. And what we've been seeing in France is the rise of streaming services, illegal streaming services. And so instead of having, you know, French users downloading, they didn't change the practice. They just changed the source. So instead of getting the file, because getting the file can be identified, they just viewed it on a site that's illegal. So we have a, lo a lot of streaming, illegal streaming sites in France that are the direct result of that. So this questions the, um, how good this policy is because you don't really 
address piracy here. You don't really educate people. You just educate them on how to circumvent the law, which is even worse. Because it means my country is a country where we've raised an army of people who know how to infringe copyright, who are tech savvy, who know how to do this. So I don't think it's the right thing. We should really be fighting against the operators of the sites. You know, those who steal movies and put them online instead of uh, looking at the wrong target. I'm, I'm saying education is important. Uh, we are uh, copyright teachers, so we know how important education is, and I mean, not just, not just in university, but before. But I don't think that educating people by sending warnings worked in the context of France, right? So now what we're seeing uh, is uh, a different phase. You know, it's because of the streaming sites, now you have in France and elsewhere, uh, a lot of injunctions, you know, that are being uh, issued by courts against intermediaries to try to block access to that, try to block access to the streaming sites. The streaming sites are there just because, you know, again, there's been a different, there's been a, a, um, a really narrow form of um, addressing the whole problem of piracy. The main problem is access to works. It's not that French don't want to pay, it's just that the content is not there. If Game of Thrones is being shown on HBO in English on a Sunday evening, French want to see the same content in their language at the same time. Otherwise, they, won't, they will download it, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the hours that follow the show. So it's really a problem of legitimacy, access of um, in, uh, um, uh, uh, an offer problem. It's, you know, the content exists. It's just that it's not being distributed by the right sources. It shouldn't be on illegal streaming sites. It should be on sites that are fully controlled by producers who have a global strategy to distribute the content. That would be the big difference. So I think the, the problem is not a, uh, let's say, a punishment or penalty problem. It's a market problem. Thank you. We're quite behind the schedule, but I hope that you agree that we take two more questions. But does we, agree? Yes. We have one <laughs> down there. So we, we've seen many interesting cases being, you know, brought to Luxembourg in the past years. Um, that's the result, you know, of there was a long transposition phase of the Tucson Directive. Then, you know, when it was put in practice in different member states, then case was, went, went to court and up to the Supreme Court of National uh, Members of Member States. And so now we are seeing the most interesting cases, maybe too late because the legislator didn't want to wait. But we've seen a lot of interesting cases that question all techniques, you know, uh, I'm getting to your question on, you know, pending and future cases. But when you look at uh, Svensson, uh, Best Water, GS Media, how could we be in, a, in 2014, 2016, questioning the, you know, what the hyperlink is? You know, this was an old battle. So that's interesting is to see that the main questions that are being asked today are about all techniques that I would think are part of the infrastructure of the Internet. So uh, that's, you know, linking is an important one, safe harbors. There have been questions, so that the Peterson case. There's another one uh, called uh, Brian uh, uh, versus NSC. It's a Dutch reference, which will also combine copyright law, I mean, the InfoSec Directive and the e-commerce directive. And it's a sort of complement to Peterson, together with Rapid Share, which in all the case referred to by the German Supreme Court, the day, I think the day after Peterson, where basically, if you look at it, it's as if the German Supreme Court would have said, well, I want to know the CJU position on good actors, that's Peterson, and on bad actors, that's rapid share. So we have at least three cases, maybe more. Uh, you may have seen yesterday another important case um, that reached the AG, uh, the advocate of the face, that's a Facebook case. It's not about copyright, but it's still about the liability of intermediaries and the extent of the obligations. And I think this case is important because it has ties with our debate, first because it's about the use of technologies to fight against something that's illegal. So according to the Advocate General, um, uh, intermediaries can be expected to use technologies to detect 
identical content or a content that's close to the illegal content. That's based on text. Uh, we don't know how to do this. You know, we know how to recognize images and videos. We have the experience of doing this with Content ID on YouTube. For text, it's very difficult, very difficult, if not impossible. So this question is, you see courts that trust technologies when we, in the technology industry, we don't trust it. Well, we, we know how many bugs and how many flaws it has. We know there's a long road before we get to the point where we could have machines understand the law. You know, uh, experts understand the law, not machines. Okay, that's very important to understand. Second thing in that decision is to what extent what is being done in Europe in that decision, in that uh, opinion, so should the development of a capacity to detect infringement be limited to Europe or be global? And I think this is also underlying in the question of Article 17 is, and, and I, I didn't touch that, but is what are platforms expected to do when Article 17 enters into force, not just in the member state where the law is, uh, where, where the directive is imposed, not just in Europe, but globally. You know, so uh, these cases are uh, important, not just for European law, but also for, you know, uh, they, they define what the internet of tomorrow could be. So uh, uh, there will be others. Um, we're expecting a decision in Vega Media. You know, Vega Media is the collecting study I mentioned earlier uh, on whether or not the German law should have been notified to the European Commission uh, as part of a, it's not a copyright uh, problem, it's much more a, a EU law problem that you must notify a regulation that's likely to affect circulation of services in a member state. So we are seeing now important questions that will be decided by CJU and uh, they answer to questions that lawmakers try to address in the directive uh, on copyright. Uh, it would be interesting to see the dialogue between the CJU and the text. Um, I refer to NSC, uh, to Brian versus NSC, the judge reference. The reference comes from a proposal of the Advocate General of the Dutch Supreme Court, where he said, well, I'm looking at Article 14 of the e-commerce directive on safe harbors. I'm looking at what was then called Article 13 of the directive, which became 17. I don't understand anything anymore. I I'm puzzled. I, you know, I don't understand what lawmakers are, s are proposing and what they say the law, the, the law should, that should be clarified, etc. So that's one of the reasons he has the question. And we wanted the court to ask the question. So I think that we really, I mean, your, your question highlights the fact that we really entered we, we, uh, unshuttered territories. We will have to navigate an environment where a court decision, I mean, a paragraph in a court decision might affect compliance of, on 17, on platforms, etc. It will be uh, difficult for everyone. It will be good for IT lawyers. So good for you. Thank you. We have time for one last quick question. Yes, please. Hello, thank you for your uh, lecture. I'm Stefan Boyevich, attorney at law from Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, my question is related to uh, taking down po uh, notice, uh, notices policies over Google platforms. Uh, in particular, uh, what is the level of uh, discrecy that you have? in responding to takedown notices in cases which are not, uh, I, know, uh, I know, identical content, but in borderline cases where you have derivative works, uh, just uh, some small fragments of works which are incorporated in some works, and what is the level of uh, discretion that you have when you respond to such uh, takedown notices? Thank you. Um... So we have many platforms, as you said. So do you have any specific platform in mind? Well, in particular, I would probably refer to YouTube. <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, copyright law is complex. And ideally, we like it to be, you know, easy to understand and, and, and identical everywhere so that, you know, we make decisions that are <coughs> consistent, coherent. So. Your question is actually, you know, about, about it, your question is the question 
each single reviewer asks himself or herself every time we are being asked to review a takedown. Should we take down or not? Is it fair use? Is it an acceptable derivative work? Is it protective exception? This is a question that is really hard to address for each single case. The problem we have is that we have to make a decision quickly, you know, because in the current notice and takedown system, if we don't act swiftly, we become liable. So as soon as we look at the content, the clock is ticking. That's a number of problems. And that's why I was saying earlier to, in response to Dushan that the problem now is that we have to make decisions even before the content goes online. And we have, we, so that is really, uh, it's, a, it's a question that's still unsolved, you know, how you can properly address uh, removal content. So we know we can make mistakes, you know, it's human. And we also that we can even make more mistakes because we have to take time. Courts, we, we cannot take time where courts, for example, would. So we put in place an appeal mechanism so that you can, uh, send a, uh, uh, you can say to YouTube that, A, maybe the content you to 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 took down here should not have been taken down. Okay, so that's a way to say, okay, let's look at it again. Okay, so that's a way to correct the, the uh, mistakes we make. But at the scale at which we operate, just for Google search, and speaking of YouTube here, on Google search, we receive 1 billion, with a B, 1 billion notices a year. So, you know, we can make mistakes. So, uh, and actually those who send the notices can make mistakes too. So they can flag things that are legal. So that's, it, it's the, uh, uh, it, it's a problem of, um, uh, of uh, application of notice and takedown in practice. And from me to you, if I had been the lawmaker, this is the problem I would have addressed. Not, you know, finding a new provision that no one understands, but to really fix the problem of notice and takedown and make sure what is legal disappears from the web and what legal is protected on the web. That to me is way more important than, uh, way more important. Right? Compensation of others is really important, but still, it's something that's also worth addressing. It's not being addressed. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have to, stop now. It, we will make a 15 minutes break before we continue with the next session, which will be in Serbian. So I would like to thank once again, Dr. Cedric Manera for having accepted the invitation to come to Serbia. It was, it was really a privilege to have you here and to follow both your presentation and the answers to the questions. So let's continue the discussion during the break. Čast da predsjedavam drugim delom ove mini konferencije. Mi ćemo se sad u ovom drugom delu baviti sistemom naziva internet domena u prethodnoj godini. Tako da, pošto budemo čuli dva referata i ukoliko nam ostane nešto malo vremena, možete eventualno postaviti neko pitanje ili dati neki komentar. Sve u svemu nemamo puno vremena, tako da molim i referente, a i vas koji budete učestvovali u diskusiji da budete najkraći mogući. E sad, pozivam našu koleginicu sa pravnog fakulteta Univerziteta u Novom Sadu, profesor Kusanju Radovanović, da nam izloži svoj rad praksa komisije za rešavanje sporova povodom registracije naziva internet domena u prethodnoj godini. Izvolite. Hvaljujem se. Ja ipak moram prvo da izrazim zadovoljstvo što sam ponovo ovde, sada već peta godina i mogu da kažem da je ovo tradicijalno okupljanje u kojem ja posebno uživam zato što se osjećam kao kod kuće sa obzirom na to da je Beogradski pravni fakultet u ovoj oblasti zaista učinio mnogo toga da iz godine u godinu bude sve više mladih i novih interesanata za oblast intelektualne svojine, a i internet domena koji su tema ovih skupova. Tema mog izlaganja danas jeste zapravo pregled prakse Komisije za rešavanje sporova povodom naziva nacionalnih internet domena u prethodnoj godini. I s obzirom to da je vreme izlaganja kratko, ja nisam želela da slučaj po slučaj vama izlažem, nego ono što bismo mogli smatrati najrelevantnijim, pa možda čak i nekim smernicama za neke buduće slučajeve koji se budu pred komisijom vodili. Ukratko samo šta je zapravo predmet tih postupaka pred komisijom. Predmet postupaka jesu zapravo nacionalni domeni, znači RS i Srb, 
i u onim slučajima kada zapravo je naziv domena istovetan ili bitno sličan žigu. Naravno, žig kao subjektivno pravo ne obuhvata i pravo da se registruje internet domen takav kakav jeste. Iz tih razloga naravno može da nastane problem u onim situacijama kada registrovani internet domen na određeni način privlači mušterije ili na drugi način se koristi žig, odnosno oznaka titulara žiga. Najprej da izrazimo praksu u prethodnoj godini u brojevima, ako ovo radi, a trebalo bi da da. Hvala, kolega. U prethodnoj godini, kad kažemo prethodnoj godinu, mi smo na kalendarsku godinu, vođeno je svega pet postupaka. Ja kažem svega pet zato što obično očekujemo neki intenzitet tih rešavanja postupaka, međutim, to je ipak u svom rečeno čak i veliki broj, s obzirom na to da takvih postupaka u sudovima, mislim, ima čak i mnogo manje. Svih pet odluka koje su donesene u okviru komisije nalaze se na sajtu, ovde je naveden tačan sajt, ali se svakako može naći na stranicama Rnica. U brojevima možemo da kažemo da od tužioca javljaju nam se tri domaća, dva strana subjekta, registranti su uglavnom fizička lica i jedno pravno, od odluka, što je zanimljivo, četiri usvajajuća i jedna odbijajuća, što znači da je zadržan internet domen kod registranta, od usmenih rasprava, iako to nije mnogo relevantno, ali pokazuje na određeni način volju registranta da se suprotstavlja zahtevu i da zadrži svoj domen, samo jedan put je bila zakazana, ali se registrant nije pojavio toliko o tome i potpuno pasivno držanje registranta samo u jednom slučaju. Kada komisija odlučuje o zahtevu za prenos po pravilu nazivanja internet domena, ima u vidu tri kriterijuma, odnosno uslova koja moraju da budu kumulativno ispunjeni. Ja ih posebno navodim. Najpre da je nacionalni domen istovetan predmetu žiga ili da mu je sličan u meri da može da stvori zabunu u prometu i dovede učesnike u prometu u zabludu. Drugi uslov jeste da registrant nema pravo, niti legitiman interes da taj domen koristi. I treći uslov jeste da je registrant nacionalni internet domen registrovo je koristio protivno načelu savjesnosti poštenja i dobrih poslovnih običaja. Ono što je relevantno jeste da ovi uslovi moraju da budu kumulativno ispunjeni. Dakle, svaki uslov od navedenih pred komisijom se posebno vrednuje i ukoliko je odgovor, naravno, na sva tri vrednovanja pozitivan, odnosno da je uslov ispunjen, tek tada odluka može da bude usvajajuća. Kada je u pitanju prvi uslov, odnosno da je domen istovetan ili bitno sličan na žigu, on je u najvećem broju slučajeva ispunjen. Tačnije, u svim ovim koje smo do sada imali, jeste ispunjen. Ono što je zanimljivo jeste da se moment, odnosno taj uslov da je žig, da postoji žig, ne uzima se trenutak kada je registrovan domen, nego se vrednuje spram trenutka kada je podnesena tužba, odnosno kada je pokrenut postupak pred komisijom. Zašto? Iz više razloga. Prvo, zato što tako i jezičkim tumačenjem se može doći do tog do te interpretacije, a drugo zato što već znamo da i prijava, zapravo prijava žiga povlači za sobom ista prava kao i sam žig kada je priznat i upisan. Najčešće ovo i nije uslov koje registranti osporavaju. Postoje samo jedan slučaj u kojem je osporavano, pri čemu su argumenti koje je registrant navodio bili toliko neubedljivi i neuverljivi da ja mislim da ni sam registrant u to nije verovao. Ticalo se recimo večernje ili vecernje, pa su isticali da je razlika u slovu č, što svakako ne možemo smatrati dovoljno različitim od registrovanog žiga. Drugi uslov jeste da registrant nema pravo, niti legitiman interes da koristi sporni naziv internet domena. Na što bi se to pravo zapravo svodilo? Najčešće se može svoditi na neku poslovnu saradnju koja postoji između tužioca i registranta, pa je tužilac recimo, odnosno registrant može da bude distributar robe ili neko ko je ovlašćeni prodavac robe koja se označava zaštićenom oznakom. Legitiman interes ne mora da bude uopšte vezan za poslovnu saradnju sa titularem žiga. Imali smo jedan slučaj, odnosno to je jedini slučaj gde je tužba odbijena, tiče se Ada Mol, a legitiman interes zasnivao se na tome da je zapravo registrant bio administrator sajta 
koji je nosio naziv Ada Mall, to je sada aktualno, pošto vam je nedavno otvoren tržni centar Ada Mall. Žig je registrovan naknadno, dakle čak i nakon registracije naziva domena, što nije relevantno za ovaj slučaj. Može naravno da posluže kao pomoćni kriterijum ocenu toga da li je savjestan ili nije savjestan, ali je smisla, odnosno ideja ili sadržina koja se uređuje na tom sajtu potpuno nekomercijalna i nepovezana sa nosiocem žiga Adam Ol. Legitiman interes su oni našli u tome što je Adam Ol zapravo bio alter ego jednog engleskog blogera koji se bavio pitanjima mode, odnosno kupovine najpovodnijih centara za kupovinu i sl. A nipošto se nije obazirao na delatnost, niti je komercijalno karaktera uopšte sajt, odnosno nije namenjen komercijalizaciji sadržaja i iz tih razloga je komisija utvrdila da je legitiman interes postojao. S druge strane, očigledno ispunjen uslov postoji onda kada je sajt potpuno neaktivan. Zašto? Ako je neko registrovao naziv domena, onda se podrazumeva da on sa tim domenom zapravo želi da se predstavi u svom rečenom internet publici, da na neki način neki svoj interes ostvari, bilo komercijalni ili nekomercijalni. Ako ga ne koristi, onda možemo da izvučemo na posredan način čak i zaključak da se može raditi o sajber spotingu, gde on zapravo sebe stavlja u poziciju pregovarača sa titularem žiga kako bi za određeni novčani iznos mogao da ponudi prenos domena. Ja se izvijem, ja sam otišla jedan sajt i nisam. Da je registrant nacionalni internet domen registrovao i koristio na čelu savjesnosti puštenja i dobrih poslovnih običaja. Ja sad moram da kažem neko svoje lično mišljenje o ovome. Mislim da je ovo najsporniji uslov. O čemu se radi? Najpre tiče se kumulacije uslova. I da je nesavestan prilikom registracije i da je nesavestan u korišćenju. To bi faktički značilo, a što jeste zapravo najveći problem, da kada je savestan prilikom registracije, to znači da je dobio saglasnost ili da postoji neki vid poslovne saradnje, odnosno da je dobio saglasnost od titulara Žiga da registruje naziv domena i u kasnijem momentu počne nesavesno da ga koristi interpretacijom jezičkom ove odredbe pravilnika, dolazimo do toga da uslov zapravo nije zadovoljen. A u praksi se to vrlo često i dešava. O čemu se radi? Imali smo primjer na prethodnoj strani, kada je postojala poslovna saradnja, pa je ta poslovna saradnja naknadno prekinuta. Registrant je obnovio važenje odnosno obnovio registraciju, poslovne saradnje više nema, a domen i dalje ostaje kod njega. Tako da tu savjesnost zapravo treba interpretirati na način da služi svrsi tog ugovora, što je komisija u tom konkretnom slučaju i učinila. Ako je saglasnost bila vezana, odnosno cilj je bio poslovna saradnja i ispunjavanje ugovornih obaveza, onda i prestanak tog razloga, cilja, motiva koji je tužioca inspirisao da saglasnost da, treba možda uzeti u obzir pre nego što se odluči o tome da je formalno u datom momentu saglasnost postojala. Dakle, formalno prisustvo saglasnosti nije dovoljno da bi se ocenilo da je ta saglasnost zaista, odnosno da je strana savesna, pa samim ti se onda i ne postavlja pitanje savesnog ili nesavesnog korišćenja, budući da kumulativni uslovi moraju biti ispunjeni. Nadam se da ovim nisam predviđeni termin izlaganja o praksi premašila i zahvaljujem vam se na pažnju. Hvala Sanja, ne da niste, nego ste se perfektno uklopili u ovaj naš raspored. Sada molim kolegu Marka Jovanović, docenta na Pravnom fakultetu Univerziteta u Beogradu, da nam kaže nešto o pojedinim spornim procesno-pravnim pitanjima u postupku rešavanja domenskih sporova. Izvolite. Hvala vam profesore Markoviću. Kao i profesor Kradovanović, i meni je velika čast što sam jedan od stalnih učesnika ovih susreta, tako da ću i ove godine pokušati da opravdam očekivanja koje su organizatori skupa pred mene postavili. Moj zadatak je da govorim o pojedinim spornim procesno-pravnim pitanjima u postupku rešavanja domenskih sporova. Kada bi se ovaj naš razgovor dešavao koji mesec kasnije, mislim da bi plan mog izlaganja bio mnogo bogatiji i mnogo interesantniji, jer u nekoliko predmeta koji su sada u toku će se dosta spornih procesno-pravnih pitanja javiti o kojima ćemo moći da vodimo lepe diskusije kada se ti postupci budu završili. Pošto to još uvek nije slučaj, ja sam rešio da se za ovaj put opredelim za dve teme. Prva je vezana za učešće stranaca u postupku rešavanja domenskih sporova, jer smo u prepodvenoj sesiji govorili o ovom prekograničnom elementu u 
pitanjima kojima se bavimo, dok sam se za drugu temu opredelio za uvek kontroverzno pitanje odnosa postupaka pred Komisijom za rješavanje domenskih sporova i sudske zaštite u ovim stvarima. Krenimo sa prvom temom. Dakle, učešće stranaca u postupku rješavanja domenskih sporova pred komisijom. Gde je zapravo prostor? Odakle dolazi mogućnost da stranac bude učesnik u ovom postupku rješavanja sporova? Stranac može biti tužilac, stranac može biti registrant, dakle može biti tuženi, može se eventualno pojaviti kao svedok u postupku. Postoje dve procesne uloge koje stranci ne mogu da ispunjavaju, gde stranci ne mogu da se nađu prema našem pravilniku, a to je da ne mogu da budu zastupnici u postupku, jer naš pravilnik traže da zastupnik bude državljeni Republike Srbije sa prebivalištem u Republike Srbije i isto tako ne mogu da budu arbitri, jer iza arbitre postoji isto veteran uslov državljanstva i prebivališta u Republike Srbije. Ali što se tiče ovih ostalih uloga, dakle tužioca tuženog, eventualno svedoka, postoji prostor za učešće stranaca. To nam otvara pojedina potencijalno sporna pitanja. Jedno od njih može da bude pitanje dostavljanja, koje može da bude delikatno kako zbog toga što bi nekada bilo problematično utraditi adresu stranca ukoliko bi se dostavljanje obavljalo poštanskim putem i zbog vremena i metoda kojim bi dostavljanje trebalo da se vrši. Srećom, od kako smo izmenili naš pravilnik u pravcu toga da se dostavljanje vrši isključivo elektronskim putem, Pitanje dostavljanja više nije izvor kontroverzi kada se govori o učešću stranca u postupku. Dakle, ono ne zahteva ni pitanje određivanja posebnog načina dostavljanja, ni određivanje posebnog vremena, utroška novca koje bi na to išlo. Dakle, dostavljanje strancima se sada dešava na isti način kao što bi se dešavalo i u istom vremenu i sa istim troškovima kao što bi se dešavalo i domaćim državljanjima. Međutim, ono što ostaje kao potencijalni problem jeste pitanje jezika. Član 21 našeg pravilnika, koji vidite na slajdu, kaže da se postupak za rešavanje sporova vodi na srpskom jeziku. Jezik postupka primenjuje se na sve pismene izjave stranaka, usmenu raspravu, odluke i druge akte arbitražnog veća. Šta ovde mogu da budu potencijalni problemi? Prvo je to da li je ova odredba uslovno rečeno imperativna. Drugim rečima, da li bi stranke mogli da se dogovore da promene jezik postupka. Ako pođemo od jezičkog tumačenja, ja bih rekao da teško da ovde postoji mogućnost za derogaciju. Dakle, odredba je prilično imperativna, dakle, postupak za rešavanje se vodi na srpskom jeziku. U prilog zaključku da ovu odredbu nije moguće derogirati s porazovom stranaka, govori jedan posrednji argument. Što se tiče samog jezika postupka, on utiče i na kriterijume za izbor arbitara. Član pravilnika koji govori o kvalifikacijama koje arbitri moraju da ispune, ni u jednom delu ne pominje njihove jezičke kompetencije. Dakle, od arbitara se traži stručnost u samoj materiji koja je predmet spora, ali se ne traži poznavanje posebnih jezika. Dakle, ukoliko bi stranke ugovorile primjenu nekog drugog jezika, to bi onda moglo da dovede u problem čitav postupak rešavanja sporova. To onda ostavlja zadatak da ukoliko bi stranac želeo da govori na stranom jeziku u postupku, moralo bi da se obezbedi prevođenje za tog stranca. To sa druge strane otvara problem troškova takvog prevođenja i pitanje toga ko snosi dužnost organizacije takvog prevođenja. Mi ne imamo eksplicitno rešenje u pravilniku za ovakvu situaciju, ali ako bismo ga sistemski tumačili, ispalo bi da ona strana koju je u interesu da stranac govori na stranom jeziku je dužna i da organizacijono obezbedi samo prevođenje, kao i da snosi troškove tog prevođenja. Može da se postavi pitanje da li bi prevođenje morao nužno da obavlja sudski prevodilac, u smislu pravilnika o sudskim prevodilacima i tumačima. Da se nalazimo u zoni sudskog postupka, ovde bi odgovor bio sasvim jasan i bio bi potvrdan. Međutim, s obzirom na to da govorimo o alternativnom načinu rešavanja sporova, govoreći čisto iz lične perspektive, nisam siguran da ovde moramo da pratimo taj paralelizam i da prevodilac nužno mora da bude ovlašćeni sudski prevodilac sa liste prevodilaca pri Ministarstvu pravde. Ostaje problem troškova, jer s obzirom na to da naš pravilnik ne dozvoljava mogućnost rešavanja o troškovima postupka, troškove prevođenja će u krajnjoj liniji snositi lice koje je te troškove predujmilo. Dakle, eventualna mogućnost naknade troškova, ukoliko bi ishod, materijalno-pravni ishod postupka to nalagao, bi onda morao da se dešava na drugom polju, što nas zapravo vodi i na našu drugu temu, a to je odnos postupaka pred komisijom 
i pred sudom. Šta je ovde osnovni izvor dilema? Osnovni izvor dilema je taj što naši propisi dozvoljavaju, i ne samo naši, to je uporedna praksa, da je dozvoljena mogućnost koja egzistencije postupaka pred sudom i pred komisijom za rešavanje domenskih sporova. Šta više, član 7 stav 3 našeg pravilnika vrlo eksplicitno kaže da prihvatanjem nadležnosti komisije strane u postupku se ne odriču prava na traženje sudske zaštite u stvari koje je predmet postupka. Na samom početku alternativnog načina rešavanja domenskih sporova kod nas postojala ideja da se napravi neka, nazovimo, isključiva nadležnost komisije za rešavanje domenskih sporova. Međutim, vrlo brzo se uvidjelo da bi takav Takvo rešenje bilo koncepcijski neprihvatljivo sa stanovišta naših propisa, jer jedan alternativni mehanizam rešavanja sporova, koji je jednostepen, nikako ne bi mogao da ima isključivu nadležnost. Sa druge strane, ne postoji nikakvo pravno-političko opravdanje da sudovi imaju isključivu nadležnost u ovim stvarima. Tako da, kada posmatramo ove stvari u kontekstu, koja egzistencija alternativnog i sudskog postupka je zapravo jedino moguće rešenje. Međutim, to što ovi postupci mogu da koegzistiraju, ne znači i da su oni uvek nužno potpuno identični. Osnovna razlika između sudskog i alternativnog postupka jeste u tome što je sudski postupak po krugu stvari kojima može da se bavi znatno širi od alternativnog. Sudski postupak se po pravilu primarno odnosi na utvrđivanje porede subjektivnog prava intelektualne svojine, dok alternativni postupak treba da bude usmeren na prestanak ili prenos registracije spornog domena, ukoliko su ispunjeni kumulativni uslovi o kojima je profesor Karadovanović pričala govoreći o praksi naše komisije u prethodnim godinima. Šta su tri moguća karakteristična scenarija za ovaj odnos sudskog i postupka pred komisijom? Prva situacija bi bila kada bi postupak pred sudom bio pokrenut pre postupka pred komisijom. Ovo bi bilo više teorijski nego praktično zamislivo, jer je ovde zapravo sva odgovornost na tužiocu. Pravilnik nema nikakvu preciznu odredbu koja bi omogućila neko odbacivanje tužbe ili nešto tome slično u slučaju da prethodno postoji sudski postupak koji je otvoren. Dakle, ono što bi moralo da se desi zapravo jeste da bi moralo da se formira arbitražno veće koje bi onda, analogno drugoj situaciji o kojoj ćemo pričati, utvrđivalo kakva će biti sudbina postupka pred komisijom, pred tim arbitražnim većim. Da li će se obustaviti, prekinuti ili će se pokrenuti, odnosno nastaviti. To bi sa stanovišta, dakle, tu ocenu će arbitri činiti od slučaja do slučaja, imajući vidu sve okolnosti, ali u situaciji kada je već pokrenut sudski postupak, opet vrlo lično mi se čini da bi za tužioca bilo preveliko kockanje, da tako kažem, da se upušta u pokretanje postupka pred komisijom nakon što je postupak pred sudom već otpočeo. Što se tiče drugog scenarija, pokretanja postupka pred sudom za vreme trajanja postupka pred komisijom, to je situacija koja je eksplicitno uređena našim pravilnikom. Dakle, kao što sam malo pre rekao, na arbitražnom veću je oglašćenje da ceneći sve okolnosti slučaja utvrdi da li bi u takvoj situaciji postupak pred komisijom trebalo prekinuti, obustaviti ili pak nastaviti. Jedina situacija u kojoj će nužno doći do obustave postupka pred komisijom bi bila ta kada bi za vreme trajanja postupka pred komisijom bila doneta pravnosnažna sudska odluka u stvari koja je predmet spora pred komisijom. Konačno ostaje treća situacija, a to je pitanje pokretanja postupka pred sudom nakon okončanja postupka pred komisijom. Ova situacija bi nekima mogla da zalični na neku vrstu kontrole odluke koju je donelo arbitražno veće. Međutim, ako bismo pokušali da napravimo neku paralelu između postupka poništa i arbitražne odluke i ove situacije, tako nešto ne bi stajalo. Ideja pokretanja sudskog postupka nakon što se postupak pred komisijom završi ne bi trebalo da bude u kontroli kvaliteta rada arbitražnog veća. Dakle, taj poništaj koji bi postojao u zoni klasične trgovinske arbitraže, Ovde ne postoji. Ovde bi se pred sudom, dakle ne bismo imali efekat res judikata takve odluke pred komisijom, pred sudom bi se pokretao ili novi meritorni postupak gde bi odluka komisije bila jedan od dokaza koje će onda sud ceniti slobodno kao i sve ostale dokaze predložene u postupku, ili ono što bi moglo da bude još interesantnija situacija jeste da se pokrene postupak za naknadu štete s obzirom na to da komisija ne može da 
opredeli troškove postupka zavisno od uspeha strana u sporu. Dakle, to bi bila situacija gde bi potencijal za korišćenje sudskog postupka nakon pokretanja postupka pred komisijom, izvinjam se, bila veoma plodna. Imajući u vidu vremenska ograničenja i to da verovatno treba da ostavimo neko vreme za pitanje, ja bih se ovde zaustavio, pa ukoliko je bilo šta ostalo nejasno ili nedorečeno, spreman sam da o tome porazgovaramo u narednom delu. Hvala vam na pažnju. Hvala najlepši kolega Ivanoviću. Dakle, nam je ostalo vrlo malo vremena da porazgovaramo o ovome što ste čuli, eventualno još o nečemu. Da li se neko javlja za reč sa nekim pitanjem ili komentarom? Izvolite. Vojslav Rodić, direktor Ološenog registra INET. Imam pitanje vezano, profesor Čiradovanović, vezano za uvođenje IDN domena i eventualno da li to može da utiče na odlučivanje u sporojima. Konkretno, do 9. decembra niste mogli da registrujete nazive sa č, č, š, mogli ste samo latinično, na primer, Radovanović. Od 10. decembra do 5. marta je bio onaj sunrise period kada ste imali pravo prvenstva da vi odaberete ili Radovanović ili Radovanović. Posle 5. marta svako može da registruje. I sad zamislite, na primer, da postoji vinarija Radovanović koja je prethodnih 11 godina mogla samo da ima radovanović.rs, ne iskoristi svoje pravo i onda se posle 5. marta neki drugi Radovanović bavi se bilo čime, limarska radnja, registrujete, a vi onda kažete, a upa čekaj, mi smo zaštitili Radovanović svojevremeno. Ovo je sad jedno spekulativno pitanje, ali na koji način će uvođenje IDN domena potencijalno uticati na donošenje odluku u ovakvim slučajima? Znači, ako biste spomenuli večernje i večernje, može da bude i večernje, makar to ništa ne značilo, ali kad pričamo o našim prezimenima, tu tek ima jako puno različitih kombinacija č i č, od kojih su neke, postoji i jedna i druga varijanta. Da li očekujete tu neke promene? Predpostavljam da još uvijek niste imali slučajeve vezano za jedin. Moje mišljenje je da može uticati nebitno, ali mislim da se to ne tiče čak upotrebe č, č i slično, nego vrednovanja da li je to isto ili slično živu. Tako da, ako je taj uslov zadovoljen, nezavisno od toga da li je ČČ ili bitno je sličan, ako je VCR nje, kada reč sama za sebe ne znači ništa. Onda svakako upućuje na to, ne mogu sad da se setim primera, gde bi moglo da dovede do bitno drugačijeg značenja C umesto Č ili obrnuto. Tada bi smo onda mogli govoriti da može uputiti. Mogu da vam kažem primer. Znači, jedna preduzetnička radnja, koja je, da li još uvek registrovana, ne znam, ali je vrlo simptomatično engleskim alfabetom pisano cicic.rs postoje domen, odnosno crs. To može da bude, mi ćemo reći pa verovatno je čičić, a možda i čičić, možda i čičić. Imamo takvih slučajeva. Zato sam postavio pitanje. Otvara se od jedan put veliki broj varijanti. Svakako da, ali svakako će se vrednovati sličnost, odnosno istovetnost. Ako je zbunjujuće, onda može uticati. Ako asocira odmah na nešto, onda ne može. Da li ima još pitanja? Ja, profesor Popović, izvodite. Pa više, kao komentar, samo da se nadovežem na ono što je koleginica Radovanović lepo objasnila i pomenula je zapravo da arbitražna veća često imaju problem sa tumačenjem ovog trećeg materijalno-pravnog uslova. Hteo bih samo za one koji nisu u toku, a rekao bih da većina to ovde već zna, da je u toku zapravo izmena pravilnika i da će ono i postati ili što će svakako olakšati rad arbitražnim većima, mada i do sada je to bilo, pa da kažemo, ekstenzivno tumačeno, što nije nikakva specifičnost Srbije i tumačenja domaćeg pravilnika, jednostavno je rađeno ono što se radilo i radi još uvek prilikom tumačenja i u DRP pravila, gde takođe taj uslov i dalje stoji kao I, a praktično, kada pogledate odluke, on se tumači kao ili. Hvala. Izvolite, kolega. Ja sam želao da postavim jedno pitanje koje je više na bazi implementacija manje samog prava. Odnosno, koliko sam ja upoznat, komisija nema nikakvo vlašćenje u pogledu implementacije odluka koje donosi, već bi te odluke trebalo da sprovodi jer nic. 
ali se to u praksi, koliko sam poučen sam iz praktičnog primjera, da to faktički ne radi jer nic, nego da radi konkretno ovrašeni registar koji je registrovao dome. I konkretno se dogodila situacija da je pokrenut spor pred komisijom koji se završio usvajanjem tužbenog zakteva gde je naloženo brisanje domena. Međutim, ovlašeni registar je mene poučio na jednom, sam bio neprijatno iznenađen, da oni nemaju mogućnost da obršu taj domen, nego da se ta odluka može sprovesti samo prenosom domena na tužioca. Ja sam bio pomalo iznenađen time i onda sam pomislio pa kao kako to podluka glasi baš ovako kako piše, pa ne, kao eto mi prosto nema tu faktičku mogućnost. I na kraju je problem praktično rešen tako što je domen prenet i nije kasnije plaćena nakada za njegovo održavanje, pa je bio ugašen. Ali me samo zanima, znači, u stvari to je više ukazivanja na problem, a više me zanima koje su ingerencije komisije u slučaju recimo da registar ne sprovodi odluku. Hvala. Možda vi možete da nam kažete nešto na tu temu? Oko ingerencije komisije ne znam. Zvanično bi trebalo da radnici sprovodi postupak. Ne znam gde je došlo do problema. Ja vas molim da to dokumentujete, pošaljite zvanično na adresu koje postoje na našem sajtu ima, da proverimo gde je bio problem i da rešimo taj problem tako da u buduće ne postoji. Postoji način kako to registar, kako to registar domena, znači rnic sam radi i ne bi trebalo da rade ovlašten registri, jer u trenutku kada domen uđe u arbitražu, on se praktično pomera iz nadležnosti ovlaštenog registra u nadležnost rnica i trebalo bi tu sve vreme da ostane do trenutka dok nema rešenje, a po rešenju arbitražne komisije on može da se pomera tamo gde je arbitražna komisija i onaj koji je dobio spor rešava. Znači, negde je došlo do tehničkog problema, nešto nije dobro shvaćeno. Ja vas molim da to napišete, da mi proverimo gde je bio problem i propust u našim pravilima i da se to u buduće ne desi. Slučaj na koji referenam je bio iz 2017. godine, sad ne znam da li je umeđu vremenu nešto menjeno. Pazite, prvi put za situaciju koju spominjete saznajem, ona nikada nije došla do nas. Molim vas, dokumentujete, pošaljite i naćemo način da ona bude rešena. Onako, shvatite kako vam kažem, dajte da se ne desi nekom drugom. Ja vas eto, zato molim. Ne, mislim, stvar je rešena, ali zanimljivo je zato što se i ovlačeni registar samo inicijativno javio. On je dobio tu odluku, očigledno, da li od komisije, da li od nica. Negde je došlo do loših tumačenja, gde je tačno, nećemo ni tražiti gde je došlo, mi ćemo samo isprojeravati da li negde kod nas u pravilima ne postoji problem, jer shvatite domet koji je pod arbitražom nije dostupan nikom drugom nego registru. Da, da, jasno. Nacionalnom registru. I... U trenutku kada je stigla odluka, a dačinalni registar je to mogao da uradi, nikakva potreba domen se vraća ovlaštenim registrima u trenutku kada je neko dobio pravo sa njim da raspolaže. One ko briše ne bi trebalo da ima zadatak da ga on obriše, tako da to negde moramo da provarimo šta piše tačno i da po tome trešimo. Dobro, bit ću slobodan onda da vam to da stavim. Hvala najlepše. Ako se ne vram, profesor Popović je tražio. Da, samo mali komentar ispred komisije. Takođe, ponavljam ovo što je Ranic rekao, nismo znali za problem. Tako da i mi ćemo se zainteresovati sa time. Niko drugi se u proteklih deset godina nije javio ni sa kakvim takvim problemom. U suštini komisija dostavlja odluku u Ranicu, u Ranic izvršava odluku. Tako da mislim da je to više pitanje za Ranic nego za komisiju. Hvala. Ima li još pitanje ili komentara? Ako nema, onda je meni palo dužnost da zatvorim ovaj naš skup današnji pod nazivom Internet Dialog. To je u stvari nešto što bi trebalo da najavi našu konferenciju intelektualna svojina internet koja će biti održana za godinu dana. Ovo je bila jedna mini konferencija, naravno ne po značaju, nego po trajanju. Puno vam hvala što ste učestvovali, što ste došli u stvari prvo da slušate, da učestvujete u njoj, hvala izlagačima i nadam se da ćemo se ovako u lepom broju videti za godinu dana. Hvala vam. Prijatno.